Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the December 2nd version of Brighties with Fiscal. Um, today, we're going to be uh, going over the releases of hat fixes that were put out in November for payroll, uh, USAS, and inventory. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started first with the payroll, followed by Amanda Folkman, who will be covering the USAS portion, and Michelle Dravis will be covering the inventory portion. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, we're all out on the SSDT wiki, the SSDT and training and trainings page. Uh, we have a release recaps uh, section. If you go to that section, you can find all the the uh, the highlights from all the releases. We're going to go ahead and obviously do November because that's what we're covering today. I'll scroll down to the USPS releases. Um, for November, we had two regular releases. One was on November 4th, and then the other one was on November 18th. Um, we had some bug fixes. Uh, one thing that they the developers did is they fixed a broken query. Uh, when you were trying to create the payables detail report in CSV or in Excel format, there was a problem with that. So they were able to go out and correct that. So now both of those formatting options work correctly. They also <clears throat> fixed an issue that was allowing uh, pay groups to change the position custom, the position custom field, and also the EMIS entry views. So they corrected that problem as well. Uh, when processing the HSA ACH submission file, uh, any error adjustments that were had been up, uh, added for employee or the board were not getting included in the HSA file. So that issue was fixed and the error adjustments now will be included in the total on the uh, HSA submission report as well as on the submission file. So those two things have been corrected. <clears throat> the afford report, um, when a uh, district were, were processing it and there was a month that had breaks, um, it was only pulling in work days and makeup days. Those were the only ones being considered. So that led to a problem when the ending date was in the middle of a break. So the break was uh, being missed because the ending date was not being looked at. So uh, the developers knew the ending date should always be considered um, when looking when when looking at breaks. So they corrected that, and not just uh, work days and makeup days are now be are not being included. So everything should be getting included. Um, it, the form report now should handle an ending date in the middle of a break in the calendar weeks. So that has been fixed, and it it is working now. <clears throat> uh, we had a few improvements. One of them, there's kind of a lot going on with the W-2 right now because we're trying to get all of that corrected before the end of the year. Um, one thing that they did is uh, the W-2 form files obviously can be quite large, especially if you have a very, very large district. Um, and that's in comparison to a lot of other processes that are ran in payroll. Um, so what we needed to do is we needed to create a table that would like temporarily store the W-2 form files instead of taking up you know, so much space and whatever, and also taking up so much more time. So when a user, now when a user runs the W-2 form report, it's going to, any of the reports, it's going to store that report, that results in this W-2 form file area. So let me go show you where that's at really quickly. And you'll notice this, this you probably won't see yet because it's going to be released today. It's on the 680.0 release. And so now when you go into reports, the W-2 report, you're gonna see many all these different options. We have a W-2 archive individual forms. So that's something new that they've added. Um, and then this W-2 form output files, that's what I'm referring to right now as far as the extra storage space. So what happens is, when you run that process, um, those reports get put out here in this W-2 forms output file uh, grid. And um, let me think here, we got a couple of the little tidbits for that. Um, it's only, it, currently they, they, the developers said that 
Um, it will only keep the last three to five runs that they, the district processes, probably so it doesn't take up so much space. Um, <clears throat> and then um, what happens is when the district, uh, in the past, the districts had to upload a zip file uh, to, for kiosk. So now what's going to happen is when they run, that form is going to actually put it out here in the zip file. And then kiosk will look at that information and pull it in. So uh, it's going to be retrieved from the kiosk or from the kiosk. So this data should be pulled in. Um, another thing too. Oh, there is a refresh button. Where is it? I don't know. I haven't really looked at this a whole lot. There's a, a trash you can get rid of or a download button, obviously. And again, this is all going to be on the December release information, but I just kind of wanted to give you a heads up because we did actually add that W2 form file information in the November releases. So I just kind of wanted to let you know that this is where all that information, all those uh, report that, if, that when you process that form report, it's going to be stored. And we'll talk about uh, the, uh, the other information as far as on the December releases, but in reality, that's not going to happen until January. So um, I just kind of wanted to show you that information. And then also, like I said, you can, you can run individual archive, uh, uh, individual form reports. So like you can run all of that information and here you could pull up a, <clears throat> a, you know, the specific payroll item configuration records. And when you create that information, let me just go ahead and schedule the job. What that does, it's going to put this information out in a new tab that we have out in our file archive. And actually I'll show you, it goes to the job scheduler. And you can see right here, this is the job that I that I process. And it's it's you know processing right now. It's unknown. Sometimes it takes a few minutes before it changes statuses, but it actually does change. And then once it completes, it actually puts that information out in the file archive. And like I said, we have a new tab under there called W2 Archive, but that, that information is all going to be stored in. Instead of the calendar year end report, all that W2 information will, will, be, will be stored in that W2 Archive file. And then the last thing that we did, let me go back in here, um, we added the option to be able to archive payroll item configuration records as well as payroll item records. So I'll show you payroll, payroll item configuration first because what will happen is if a district goes out and archives a payroll item configuration record, it will archive that record and payroll item configuration, but it also archives the payroll items related to that, uh, that uh, item. So I'm gonna go ahead and go out here and I'll just show you in payroll items. I'll just show a, a random payroll item and we'll go into the uh, payroll item archive and archive it. So let's just look at the 556. So if I go into the payroll item configuration record, and I pull up the 556, and I go into that 556 and I archive it and save that change. You'll see now I can't find it unless I do the include archived option and payroll item configuration. If I go back, go into the payroll item record <clears throat> and try to find the 556, you will see there are no records because they're all archived because of the payroll item configuration record being archived. But if I do the include archive, obviously they pull up. So that information will be, that will happen if they, if they um, archive a, a payroll item configuration record. The district also has the capability of just, you know, archive, archiving a payroll item for an employee. So I could just go find an employee. Let's just say I wanted to archive this 550 record for Brent Hurst. I could go into that record. Maybe, there we go. Um, oh, shoot. That isn't a good one because I already archived it. Let me, let me try this one. Let me try the 601. 
<clears throat> yeah, let me archive the 601 for Brett Hurst. We'll do that. And if I just pull him up, I want to, I don't want that include archive to be checked. So I, you'll see here, he doesn't have a 601 record listed. And if I include the archive, that 601 is now included. So we added the, that, those features. And you just have to remember when archiving the payroll item configuration record, it will archive all of the payroll items associated with that record as well. Um, are there any questions? We didn't have a whole lot, but that was just uh, what we uh, fixed and added. So if anybody has any questions, but please go ahead and ask. That's great. Okay, no questions. Let's go ahead and we'll switch over. Amanda, if you wanna go ahead and jump on and share your screen, that would be terrific. Sounds good, thank you, Lori. Make sure I'm doing the right one here. Okay. And where's my recap, there we go. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the USAS side here and the updates that we had in November. Um, we had two regular releases and a hotfix in the middle. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is just the bug fixes and um, a couple of things here. The PO refresh utility, you might be familiar with this um, if you've ever used it in the past, um, but it is just kind of a miscellaneous option that we have on the utilities menu um, that, that just kind of like goes and looks at the purchase order um, like information and if it needs to um, be like updated for some reason. It's basically something that is only used uh, usually if we're working with you on a ticket, we might say, hey, go try this refresh. Um, but we found an issue with that. There was a bug and so we fixed it. So um, this is available um, to admin users and it works properly now if you um, do ever need to use that. Um, okay, so then account change is the next thing. We found a situation with account change where it was running into an error if there was a PO that had zero quantity. Um, and what we did is we, we just fixed account change so that it can properly cope with this. So if, if these POs exist for your um, districts, then account change will just be able to accommodate for that. Um, however, I put some notes here. I would suggest like I wouldn't I would suggest avoiding POs with a zero quantity if possible. Um, you know, obviously, if it's not like intentioned or something like that. But um, I I feel like there's, you know, it's come up before, um, you know, and obviously we had to, to fix this process to accommodate. And um, what, let's go look at a PO here. Uh, let's see. So if I create one. And the field I'm talking about is right here. So basically how this works is this quantity and this unit price will calculate the item total. So like I do understand there are situations where they might have a zero dollar item total. Sometimes they do that for shipping or things like that. Um, if that's the case, they, they can still do quantity one price of zero because one times zero is zero. But zero times zero, that math messes up. Um, it, you know, I mean, we've seen it like in this case, we saw it, um, it was having a problem with the zero times zero calculation when it hit account change. So, you know, I mean, um, we fixed it for this process. So, you know, it's not like the end of the world if it happens. But I think just to um, avoid like potential problems, I would suggest not making that like a common practice. We do have a JIRA issue um, that would be able to add a rule or like a warning uh, or for a warning or an error so that like if they did enter that they would get flagged. So it doesn't flag them right now. So, you know, what we did is made sure that we um, updated this process to account for it. Okay, and um, the next one, the audit report. So we corrected it to um, prevent returning basically a null error. So it was um, 
having an error. And whenever we talk about null, that's going to be like a blank field or blank information. So if there was something that was blank in one of the fields that when you were trying to pull an audit report, it basically was just stopping it from generating. So um, this just corrected that so that the report can still generate even if there is like a blank field in something that you're trying to uh, that falls into the parameters that you put in. All right, and then um, the last two here actually are related to performance issues um, as far as like bugs. Um, one of them was a bug that was introduced that we um, went back and uh, corrected. I believe that was the hot fix. And um, so these two were cleaning up bugs related to performance issues. And I am keeping an eye on chat. So if you have questions about any of these as we go through, just let me know. Um, because now we're going to get into the improvements. So the first one on here is performance for refunds. Um, re so we had, uh, I mean, we've been working on performance improvements for a while. Um, reports have been a huge focus and some different pages in the software. Um, this one, so it wasn't specifically a bug like those other ones we just talked about, but this was just looking at the overall performance of the refund grid of creating a refund, editing a refund. I know this grid was a bit behind. And um, so especially when users are creating like, you know, a lot of refunds or, or um, a situation like that, it was, uh, it was taking quite a bit of loading time. So if we go here, the refunds, um, once the, gr the um, grid loads um that loads pretty quickly and then also creating so creating to pop up and have the new record um create and editing um it was taking much more loading time but you can see i can come in here and and click to open these or um, do the next action pretty quickly so they did some great work on updating that And the other one here is um, the receipt reversal option. So we we had this receipt reversal option in here. In here, let's go to our receipts grid. We had this option in here. And so basically what this is going to do, um, I have an example one here. Let's do... Um, You can see, um, so this first one here is uh, kind of an example one I did ahead of time, and we'll look at one together too. But um, so say this Bowdoin Cafe receipt that I'm looking at here, um, this one, I need to reverse it. I need to undo it. And if it's in a previous month, then I can't just delete it, um, which if I did here, I have October close. So if I try and delete it, it'll give me an error. Plus, I might not want to necessarily delete it. I might want to have that record and then have a record that I'm undoing it. And so um, what this reverse option does is it creates. So here, let's open. So this is the original and it's for 915. And here's all of my um, different line items. And then if I open the reversal, it's for the exact negative amount of each of these lines to each of these accounts. So that posts like a counter entry um, to that. And um, so, and, and you'll notice that's dated now in December in like the current date, um, or I have November open too, so I could do it in November or December. Um, but so let's go to a different one here. Let's go to this high school store. The option is right on the top here for reverse. And the reverse receipt date is when it's going to post that negative one. So my negative 915 was like my undo was in December. So I can post this one here, generate reverse receipt, boom it goes ahead and posts this. And so basically this option, this reverse option has been in here, but what it was doing is it was still checking the original receipt date. So like, even if my new date was December, it was still checking the October date and then it wasn't letting you use that reverse option. So now you can, that's all fixed. And that makes it really easy if they do need to reverse something, they can just go ahead, couple clicks there and um, get it taken care of.
All right. And then this last option on here. So I, I wanted, I'm glad that we have these sessions so I can talk about something like this because this is important to note. So we had, we had some, and um, we had an issue basically to look at the USAS manager role. We had a JIRA issue to look at the USAS manager role. Um, this kind of came up in the context originally of um, being able to enable or disable the SSDT report bundles. And um, what we did is we reviewed this USAS manager role to make it consistent with what a group manager um, has in USPS regarding reports and report bundles. And um, in USPS, the group manager has the admin reports permission, and that's what we added in USAS. So um, that keeps the, the applications consistent. Um, this does allow them to be able to enable and disable report bundles. Um, but be aware, like it does give them some additional report permissions. So their report manager may look a bit different. Um, but it is nice because they can manage, you know, the reports that are added for their district. Um, and then I have a couple tips here and I'll jump in as a manager. If this is, you know, something they're not used to seeing and they want, um, I just have a couple easy ways for them to still narrow it down to their reports, um, you know, to, to adjust. So, okay. So let's go here. And um, I'm going to log out of my admin user and log into my manager. So this, this user has USAS manager role. So this we're seeing this as a USAS manager. And USAS manager is probably like your treasurer, maybe like assistant treasurer would have this role. Um, it's the one that lets them open and close the posting periods. So this is probably just restricted to you know, one, maybe two people at the district um, that are doing, that are, you know, entrusted to have that higher level access. Um, so I come in here. So first of all, let's go look at these report bundles. And now if they created report bundles, like all along, like you would be able to manage your own report bundles, but the monthly bundle, the fiscal year end bundle, the calendar year bundle, those are all listed under SSDT because we added those to all districts. So that's where they were limited is they weren't able to manage these SSDT created bundles because it wasn't um, under their user basically. But now that they have the admin reports, they're able to um, enable or disable any of these bundles, including the SSDT ones. So um, if they do run into a situation where they need to go back and open a prior posting period and um, they don't want the monthly bundle to run again, they are now able to come in here and uncheck this, um, do what they need to do, and then you know come back and recheck it for the next month. The report manager. So if I come in here, I have um, my reports. So I'm a manager. And um, or I have here, I'm going to go ahead and just sort this created by a couple times so that I pull these in order. So this is a good tip right here. If they want to sort their created by and see, you know, who, okay, so these are this user's reports that they imported or created, either imported or um, maybe customized. Here's uh, my reports and here's this user. So that's a nice organization um, tip. Or like what I did before, they could just go ahead and type their own username right in here and then just see theirs. Um, so that is also possible. Like if they're, you know, if they go in there and they're like, whoa, 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 I can see everyone's now, you know, I'm used to just seeing mine. Well, this is a way that they could just, you know, easily go in and filter that down so that they don't have to look at them, um, them all <laughs> um, if they're trying to find something specific. The other thing that I would recommend too, um, this may be, you know, more handy now if they're in the situation is using this favorite um, checkbox. So if I want to just have, you know, certain reports that are my reports that I created, um, I think I'm doing too much on the screen. Hang on, let me just try and refresh this real quick. Um, so if I want to, oh, there we go. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. 
<laughs> too many clicks. Uh, so if I just go ahead and click this to favorite it, then that's going to put it on my homepage. So say I want that one and, you know, I want like one of my SSDT reports. Um, and then on my homepage, I can just see those reports that, um, that I want to see. I also have the username here to prevent any um, confusion there. Um, so we have a question. Can they now see ITC created reports too, or do we still need to share them with the manager role to allow them to see? Um, the UCS managers will see all reports created. So if you, um, as an ITC user, have logged in and um, imported reports for them, the manager role will see all of them. So you don't have to do that extra step of sharing if that's something that um, that you are doing. And we can see, so like I'm logged in as the manager. And uh, so if I come in here to my report manager, like the admin reports are in here as well. So this is my admin account for this um, instance, and I can see all of those. So the other thing, and this came up, um, I, I did have a question about this, and I believe that person's here. So, um, but I wanted to show this as well because, you know, I understand like this is, um, you know, a difference with their permissions, they're getting more. If this is something that you might um, not want to, have, like if a district doesn't want all of this, um, you can customize the role. So, you know, we added this as part of the SSDT uh, role. Let me go back to my um, admin account. So we added this as part of the default USAS manager role, but certainly if you wanted to customize and you know have a role for your managers that doesn't have this. Um, one really um, nice tip, so USAS manager, I'm just going in and I'm gonna act like I'm editing this role, okay? Um, and this is kind of a shortcut so that you don't have to fully recreate it. Um, so I can give this a custom name. And um, actually, let, let me do this here. Let's move this. Let me make our, won't make our ID name too long. So basically what I'm doing is I just need to rename this ID and then I can make the changes that I want to change. And when I save this, it actually will save this as a new role. Cause I can't like, I can't change the SSDT role. It has the underscore in the name. So like if I did try and change it and save it as that name, it's not going to let me. But if I give it a new name, now I have the standard uh, manager role, and then I have this manager role without the um, admin reports. And then you could go into your users and um, switch that out. You, you would have to go update um, their roles on their user record and um, switch this to manager and then that would be like they were before. So that is possible, um, you know, if that's something that you want to do, um, you know, obviously like if there are updates in the future to like the standard SSDT roles, it's kind of nice to have that role, you know, um, that you're using for the users, but you have that custom, that um, customizability um, with the roles so that um, you can have them set how, how you'd like at your ITC. Okay. Um, so that is all I have for the user side. Do we have any other questions about um, those bug fixes or improvements before we switch it over to Michelle for inventory? Okay. All right, Michelle, I'll hand it over to you. Sounds good, thank you. You guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk inventory here. Um, with um, November, um, obviously we did encounter some issues with uh, districts closing out in inventory for 22 and opening in 23. Um, so we have one uh, regular release and we have some hot fixes, which we have one more coming up. I'm hoping that it goes out today. Um, but uh, we had three hot fixes. Um, and then, I, like I said, one more, we're going to have hot fix four for 127 coming out here 
And then um, 128 is just right around the corner. We don't have any set times of when these inventory releases are any set schedule, like every two weeks yet. We're just not on that cycle yet with inventory due to, you know, it's still new. We're still, you know, trying to iron out um, some of these bugs that are happening. Um, so we're trying to get things out as soon as they're tested and ready to go. Um, we do know that um, some districts, you know, were on a time crunch with um, their gap reporting. And I know some have filed extensions. And so, like I said, we're trying to get this out as quickly as we can. And our developers are really concentrating on, on getting these bug fixes taken care of before we do any other um, further improvements or minor issues. So the critical issues are first, for sure. With that, uh, what I've done is I've tried to categorize these bug fixes um, by you know, the report or area in inventory um, that was um, fixed on this. So we'll get into these here. Um, so the first one here, um, we did do on the least asset listing report, um, we had an issue that it was, um, wasn't correctly applying the status in the least type. So you could go in and I'll just go to that quick. You can go in and select a lease type or select a specific um, item status such as active, but it wasn't applying those on the report. So um, that was fixed on the 127 release. So if you do go in and select specifics, um, it will, like if you just want active items, it will just include the active items on the report. So that was taken care of. Um, the following reports were not applying the exclude ID parameter. We had fixed that uh, several releases ago. I think it came back up as an issue. Um, and so it was the fixed asset by source, the schedule of change in fixed assets, and the schedule of change in depreciation. So what I'm talking about, go into the schedule change in fixed assets. I'm talking about this exclude entity ID. So if they, you know, those of you that aren't familiar with that, um, on an item, they can go in and enter in an entity ID. And they usually do this for um, lots. Let's say they have, they have like a group of chairs or something. And so, and there's, you know, a group of a hundred of them. So the total amount of those is over the cap threshold. And so if, um, so it'll be considered capitalized, but if you broke those down and split those out, they would all be under the capitalization threshold. So if you don't wanna split them out, you wanna leave them as a lot is what they're called, but you want to exclude them from the gap reports, then you would enter in an entity ID on the item record and then what happens then is that entity ID and they can give whatever name they want. I've seen no gap, you know, non-gap, exclude, whatever. Um, and so they would put that entity ID name here, like on this schedule change in fixed assets, and it will not include that item's amount in the report. Um, so like I said, that wasn't working properly, but we got that fixed. Um, on the 127.1 hotfix. So that's been taken care of. Let me go back. And see here, um, the fixed asset by source. Um, so that's one of the gap reports. And we updated um, the acquisition um, view. So the acquisition window underneath transactions, acquisitions, um, to allow the account code to be modified. Um, and that was something that was allowable in uh, EIS. So if I go back, show you that here. So if I go under acquisitions, and I'm just gonna click on the first one here. Um, if I edit this, it will allow me, you notice that this is now bolded, um, which means it's an editable field. So I can go in and change the account code. So if I didn't have an account code in here, um, I can go in and add that. Um, so that's something that we've added in here. 
Uh, what we were running up against was a few releases ago, um, for those that didn't have a, an account code in there, the fund dimension especially, it was displaying on the reports as invalid. And what does that mean, right? So we wanted to fix that. We got um, some tickets about that. Like, what is, what is this, where is this coming from? And so we, one, wanted to allow them to change this in order to put some kind of account code in here. But we also made some other changes um, on that same issue. And so I wanted to kind of explain to you guys what this um, fixed asset by source is pulling from. I explained it a little while ago, um, I think on our last Fridays with Fiscal we did for inventory, but now that that fix is, is here and it's been fixed, I don't wanted to go through that with you again, just so you understand how those are getting pulled in to the fixed asset by source. So, um, so after that 127.1 hot fix, where we allowed them to um, change the account code dimension and made some other changes in order for it to work more like the classic uh, EIS 101 report. So if, you know, this stuff was migrated over and they did not have an account code, that's fine. You know, they don't have to go in and change all of these. They don't have to do that. Um, but this is how the report works. So if that fund dimension on the account, on that acquisition is blank, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the fund dimension on um, the asset fund, not the account code fund, the asset fund, and it's going to reference that. And then it's going to include the amount, like the $1,000 here, and it's going to include it on the acquisition prior to system startup under whatever fund type um, is tied to that asset fund. So looking here again, my account code's blank. So I can't reference anything in there. So I'm gonna go look at my fund. My fund is general fund. So if I would go into core funds and look up to see what the general fund fund type is tied to, it's tied to governmental. So where am I going to put this? This is a capitalized asset. I'm going to put the $1,000 underneath the governmental fund type section of the fixed asset by source report in the acquisitions prior to system startup. That's how this scenario is going to work. Now, obviously with inventory, there's all kinds of scenarios. So another scenario is what if, you know, this information was migrated over and again, it didn't have a fund dimension on the account code, but it didn't have a fund, asset fund either. What does it do? So what it's going to do then is it, um, obviously, there's no fund to reference. So it's going to place it in the unknown section of the fixed asset by source report under acquisitions prior to system startup. So that's where that $1,000 is going to be accounted for. Now, if they do have a fund dimension um, that migrated over, um, and this is then obviously if they're adding them, you know, and redesign as well, um, and they've got a fund dimension in there. If that fund dimension, so O10 here, is also listed underneath four funds, so in this case it is O10, O10, it's tied to the governmental fund type, it's going to take that amount and include it in that governmental section of the fixed asset by source report. And it's going to show it under that fund, project fund 010, and there's the amount. So our last scenario is if um, the account code um, is in there, so the fund dimension is listed in there, but that O and O is not listed in core funds, where does it go from here? It's gonna go look at the asset fund and it's the 001 fund. So from there then, the 001 is tied to the governmental. So that amount will then get pulled into the governmental fund type section of the fixed asset by source report underneath the 010 fund. 
So it's still going to pull that fund dimension in here and list it there. Um, there's the thousand dollars. So that's how the report is working now. Um, and this is something where I'm kind of mulling over how to document this in, but I feel like it needs to be documented in the report. So maybe under kind of some kind of miscellaneous um, information to show what it's doing. Um, so, you know, it just depends. Is the district, um, do they have like an acquisition? Are they pulling this from the pending file? Um, and, it, you know, it does have an actual account code or were these a bunch of items from Classic that never had them that got migrated over. So we, I just kind of want to maybe explain, the, explain a little more in detail in the documentation how that fixed asset by source report works. But um, I hope that this kind of helps um, explain it a little bit better to you guys on how that's now working after that 127.1 hot fix. Okay, um, the next thing here is the schedule of change in fixed assets. And we've had some, some um, issues with this um, when districts were closing like 22 and redesign and opening 23 and the beginning balances for 23 and we're not tying out to the prior ending balances for 22. Um, on both the fixed uh, schedule change in fixed assets and the schedule uh, change in depreciation. So we're still kind of working out some of the kinks in this. Um, so the 127.4 hotfix hopefully will take care of the rest of the issues that we were having with this. But, um, but I just kind of wanted to explain um, what was happening with these. And so with the schedule of change in fixed assets, what was happening with that is that um, the beginning balance values uh, for the new fiscal year, um, when, you know, when they closed the prior year, um, they weren't getting properly calculated. So that was done and fixed on the 127.0. Well, um, we were still having issues. They were still not tying out correctly. So we had to create um, on the 127.2, we went in and further evaluated this and made more updates in order to get things correct on that. Um, so we you know, did an attempt on the 127.0 and that did, did take care of some, but we had some unique situations where there were still having problems. Um, and so, um, also on the schedule change in depreciation, um, with that one, the beginning balances and the continuing items were including future depreciated amounts. So again, if you closed 22 and you had 23 open, it was going back, if you ran a report for 22, it was going back including the life to date depreciation that was calculated when 22 closed. Um, it was including that as well as the continuing amounts from 23. It was including that on the 22 reports if you ran them, you know, after you closed and you ran reports for 22. So that was fixed as well. Um, and we got that corrected on the hot fix, the 127.2 hot fix. And also um, for both the schedule of change in fixed assets and the schedule change in depreciation. Um, we had a situation where they were excluding items that were disposed of in a future year on the 22 reports. So they were disposed of in 23, but if you went back and ran um, the 22 reports, it wasn't including those. Um, and so um, that was fixed as well on the 127.2. So, um, and so, but we still had um, some tickets where things weren't still um, tying out. Um, I think one was a particular district. And so um, we created the 123 or 127.3 to fix that. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, and like I said, um, we still have a couple other um, tickets out there where things still aren't aren't balancing correctly um, and tying out. And that's where this 127.4 hot fix is going to fix that. Um, but I'll get to that here when I talk about the migration stuff. Um, and I'll talk about 127.3 in a little more. 
Um, what we've also done, and this has been, been a request for so long, and I'm so glad that we finally um, fix these. I wouldn't call them improvements. Um, they were bugs because the classic uh, EIS 305 was working this way. We finally updated the book value um, and fixed quite a few things um, in regards to the proper year showing on the book value, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, when you put in 2023, it was just including, you know, those amounts for 23, um, so we made some um, major changes, and I believe these were all on the 127.0. Um, we had three different issues um, that were um, done in order to fix this. Um, and if I go into, I think I might have like a little screenshot here of the book value. So the first thing we did is made sure that the book value report had the correct year. It wasn't reporting the correct year. The amounts were correct. It's just that the report wasn't showing. A book value should be up through the current year that you're in. So if I was in, if, if, if fiscal year 23 is my current period, my book value would show me everything up through where I'm currently at in 23. Um, so we've made that change. So that was fixed. Another um, request from the auditors was um, including the function code. Um, on the report. So we were aware that wasn't included. So um, we um, added that to the report. And this report's pretty tight. We've got a lot of information in here, but we were able to squeeze that in. So those were two of the things um, that we did. Um, sorting and subtotaling. Subtotaling is now based on user parameter selections. Yay. So when I go in here and go into the book value report, um, what was happening with um, the sorting, it was just sorting by default on I think fund type and then tag number or fund and tag number, I think it was fund and tag number. Um, and so, and then if you tried to, you know, want to sort it by asset class thinking it's just going to sort by asset class and subtotal by asset class, it wasn't. It was sorting by fund, tag number, and asset class. So that wasn't helpful. Um, and so we have fixed all of that now. And um, now when you go in and actually select a specific sort, it's going to sort and subtotal on that. So we were very happy to, to uh, um, fix that. Also corrected the report to include unknown fund type items. So if though you have items on there that do not have a fund type associated with them, there's going to be an under, there is an undetermined section on the book value, and that's where those um, items are going to be placed. So um, that that was you know the improvements basically that we did with the book value. Um, one other thing with the book value as well that we updated, and that was on the 127.2 hotfix, um, is if um, it was corrected because um, it wasn't um, properly displaying the correct values for the fiscal year that it was generating for. So previously, if you're currently in 2023, but you were running the 22 report, it was including the 23 values. Um, so we had co we corrected that on the hot fix number two um, in order for that to report it correctly. Um, so with the 127.3 hot fix that we had, we did have an issue with, um, you know, with the 127.2, there was, I think, one particular district that things still weren't tying out for them. And so what was happening is they were trying to uh, recalculate um, the depreciation and it was um, like zeroing out, you know, and correcting the, the depreciation, but the depreciation adjustments that you see on the item uh, were not being cleared out. So we um, corrected that on the 127.3. So that's what this migration importer thing is talking about. Um, so that fixed that particular district's issue. But like I said, we still have a couple of tickets sitting out there, uh, probably about a handful of them here, um, that still after the 120, you know, 
all the hot fixes, they still aren't tying out. We have determined the issue. The QA team is testing it right now, and I think they're almost done with that. Um, that um, and we have tested it against those tickets that we have um, in order to confirm that everything's good to go. And um, once that's out, then um, for those particular tickets, those of you that know what I'm talking about that have districts uh, waiting for that, uh, we will provide the instructions on the tickets on how to get those values corrected. So again, that's on the 127.4 hot fix that I'm hoping is going out um, before the end of the day. Um, the last thing that we did um, is we had an issue, and I know most of you have migrated your districts over, so not too much of a problem anymore, but uh, we noticed that um, disposition records were being migrated over if the item record did not exist. Um, so, you know, we corrected that because if the item record never migrated over, then the disposition record that was tied to it shouldn't have migrated over either. Um, and so the actual migration, that inventory results file, will show an error now to say that this disposition um, will not migrate over um, because the existing item record or the associated item record doesn't exist. So we fixed that as well. So yeah, so we had a, a lot of um, work. And I think the main reason um, that we had a lot of bug fixes to do this last month is due to those districts closing out inventory in 22 and redesign and, you know, and going into 23 and reports not tying out. So, um, so like I said, we tried to attack those as soon as we could, thus pushing off some of these other tickets that we've had out there um, with other non-critical issues. So now hopefully after we get hot fix number four out, you know, we can settle back in and start looking at the rest of this stuff and getting that taken care of. So I appreciate you guys' patience and understanding through all of this um, and you know, hopefully everything's smooth sailing with these ending beginning balances from here on out on these gap reports. Okay, any questions regarding um, the inventory releases here this past month? Okay, now that I have your head spinning here. Um, the last thing that I just want to touch upon here for you guys um, is, just talking about what's coming up. Um, so we have here in the month of December, two more sessions. Um, we have a, a tips and tricks when processing receipts and refunds that Amanda will be covering uh, next week. And then on the 16th, we're doing the ITC management application and uh, Lori Nye and I will be going over that and how that will work for those ITCs that are going to be submitting um, W-2, ODJFS, and 1099 information on behalf of their districts, we will be covering that. Um, I know that we do have the documentation out there, but it isn't visible yet. Um, but I'll give you guys a little sneak peek of what we're doing here um, for those of you that will be doing this for your districts. Um, so in here, um, we have here where you can go to the user manual, which right now is on lockdown. Um, but this is kind of uh, where we're going with this is these are the actual options that will be available. Here is the beginning window, the homepage, I should say, of this with how you're going to be able to go in and upload districts and then pull in their 1099, ODGFS, and W-2 information um, and merge that. So those are going to be the big three where you're going to be doing the merging. Also users, these are the users that will be using the application, which is just ITC staff and the organization, which would be the ITC and your information in there. So um, it's a very simplistic, um, not a whole lot to it. Um, and um, so, like I said, Lori and I will be covering that with you guys um, in a couple of weeks and just get you a little more familiar on how to use that application. And let me see, other than that, what we're planning on doing um, for calendar year 2023 for our Fridays with Fiscal is um, um, 
we're going to discuss maybe doing a survey and sending it out to you guys on um, topics that you want covered um, for fiscal year or for calendar year 2023. So we're going to kind of give you guys uh, choices and kind of rate them um, on, you know, most important to least important for you, what you would like to see. Um, and then we're we'll also going to have a section at the bottom of the survey for you to fill in, you know, topics that you would like to see covered that weren't on the survey. Um, that way, then we get a better handle on what you guys are wanting for 2023. And then we will be able to go in and create um, and post that information in. Our goal, again, is to try to provide, you know, at least, you know, two to three sessions a month. Um, we are still going to continue doing these recap sessions as the first uh, on the first Friday of every month and then try to do you know, one USAS, one payroll, and or one inventory uh, session in there throughout the entire year. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking into that, you know, trying to get gear up for that, as well as like um, what we have, what we've called beginner training. You might revamp that a little bit too as well and make that more of a concentrated um, on just maybe processing instead of just going through each menu um, on the uh, for beginner trainers. Um, we feel like it's going to be more effective if we just concentrate on, you know, things that are done most often and focus on those. Um, so, you know, we always do that in March. Um, so we'll look into that as well as what we're going to do with that. Uh, but yeah, that's where we're at. So be on the lookout for a survey here within the next couple of weeks. And it's just going to be sent just to you guys. Um, it's for you. This is train the trainer session. So you guys fill that out and uh, that will help us a lot in determining uh, where, what, where to go from here for uh, Fridays with Fiscal in the new year. Okay, I think that's all I have. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Um, so yeah, uh, do you guys have any other further questions? Okay, I do, I do have to say this um, because this is Lori Miller's final training session. Um, she will be retiring here at the end of the calendar year. So I just wanted to give Lori a, a final send off, um, thanking her, you know, for all of the amazing training sessions that she has done. You know, we, I know you all will miss her as we will miss her dearly. Um, but I just wanted to thank her again for everything. Um, and I see everyone's posting some wonderful comments uh, to Lori, um, but we appreciate everything that she has done. She will be greatly missed. Those are sweet, you guys. All right. Um, if you guys don't have anything else, you guys have a great, great weekend, and we will see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone.